Hi there, hope you're having a lovely day so far. Well, this COVID-19 era has brought about a wide range of situations and scenarios that we never ever thought possible. You know, to begin with, the thought of having to assist your children's teacher by observing your child at home during homeschooling sessions would definitely be close to the top of many parents' lists, no doubt. Now, did you actually know that homeschooling um, was a trend and um, was on the rise well before the COVID-19 era? Yeah, there were actually over 20,000 Australian children being homeschooled uh, before the pandemic actually hit. So who better to help you with some homeschooling tips and tricks than a parent who does this every single day. Now joining us today is a special, our, our special guest, Sharon Pegram, a mother who's been homeschooling her children for the, uh, for the last four years and ha has over eight years experience in educating children. Now, whilst homeschooling her two boys full-time, Sharon has also juggled a happy home and built a thriving business. Now, Sharon um, is going to share with us today the pivotal concepts and structure, how she works, and these tips, no doubt, will help you find your flow. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sharon. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Now, Sharon, for any parent watching and listening in, I'm sure they would love to know, to begin with, how have you achieved all you have and just stayed sane? <laughs> um, I guess I would call it organised chaos. Um, when I was running Family Day Care, that's what we called it. It's organised chaos. Um, so I won't pretend that everything is, is sunshine and butterflies all the time. Um, there's definitely been many times that I have been in the middle of the day and just thought, oh, I just sent my kids to school. They have been there for six hours. I could do all my work in one day and be <laughs> done with it. Um, but I think it was really important for us to homeschool. Um, and we just made it work. So we trialled a lot of different strategies. We networked with a lot of different families. We tapped into the resources that we needed and we just nutted it out. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess after parents now have sort of like dipped their toe in the water of homeschooling per se, um, I'm sure there are many that um, may now be scratching their heads as to why you systematically <laughs> chosen <laughs> to homeschool your children. Can you tell us a little bit about why you actually chose to do that in the first place? Sure. And I, I always joke that we homeschool because I could never get up early enough to get my kids to school <laughs> and be all dressed and make lunch. Um, but jokes aside, really for us, um, for starters, my boys have social anxiety. That kind of solidified the choice. But we had chosen to homeschool them since day one mm -hmm. um, when they were little. A lot of our friends already homeschooled. That was part of the network that we were in. But for us, it was about the fact that I wanted my kids to learn in a way that served them really well. I wanted them to learn how to follow their interests, how to have executive function. I wanted them to be the entrepreneurs in the world to follow their dreams. For me, school is way too much about conformity and having to follow rules. And whilst we have rules in our house, they're ones that make sense and there's a reason for them. We don't have kind of just random rules. Mm -hmm. And I think as well, the competition in school is one that, um, that I, it doesn't really resonate with me. My eldest is the most non-competitive child in the world. He won't compete in things. He just doesn't care about that at all. And there's a lot of that kind of pitting kids off against each other. And I just knew that that kind of structure for my kids was just not going to serve them. Mm -hmm. um, so it was the, um, the decision along with the fact that they have social anxiety that is actually has been the right choice for you and your family. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. We would, I would not do it any way different. Even the hard times I would take them because it's really, it's benefited my children so much. And I love spending the day with them. I love seeing them learn. I love being able to go out and, you know, go to museums and art galleries and do that stuff along them I learn a lot as a homeschooling parent yeah. about a lot of different things mm -hmm. yeah well nationally homeschooling numbers have almost doubled in the last few years um, and really are continuing to grow um, what do you personally see as being the benefits of children being homeschooled by their parents um, 
I guess it depends specifically on the family. So everyone homeschools for a different reason. Um, we've got friends who are religious and that's why they homeschool. We've got friends who've got kids who have, you know, a disability or like my boys, they have social anxiety and that's why they homeschool. And then for other people, they're, you know, unschoolers where they have even less kind of rules and structure than us and they just want their kids to be able to be really free form. I think benefit wise, kids get to follow their interests and learn. And by that, I don't mean we get up in the day and go, what do you want to do? Do whatever you like. I mean that as opposed to if you're in school and they say, we're studying ancient Egypt this week. I say to my kids, what, it, what do you want to learn about history? Maybe it's Rome. Maybe it's the World War. They get to kind of follow their interests and they get to kind of learn how to learn through that. They work out that learning and education is about finding out all this interesting, fun stuff. Um, and I think the other thing is that my kids get way more free time than kids in school do. So we do, our homeschooling consists of about an hour to two hours a day. That covers everything because of the way that we learn. Um, and they get the rest of the time to run out in the bush, run three acres, run in the bush, you know, do all kinds of play Lego and all kinds of stuff. So yeah, it serves us really well. So off the record, and just really briefly, can you please explain to us how traditional homeschooling works? I mean, do you specifically need any qualifications as, as the teacher? Do you have to register? If so, who with? And do you actually teach the national curriculum at home? Yeah, so yes, we, um, I'll start with the national curriculum. Yes, we have to cover the national curriculum. So as homeschoolers, um, in order to homeschool, you basically contact your local education department office. You say, I want to homeschool, they send you a form, you fill it out, send it back. Mm -hmm. You're assigned a moderator. So um, that's someone from the education department and they come out and visit you. And the first time it's really just like, well, tell me how you plan to do this. Like, what do you plan to teach? And that can be anything. You can say, oh, well, for reading, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and give them some ideas. Show them that you have some kind of understanding of what children will need to progress. Mm -hmm. And then they just come and visit you at, at intervals, depending on who you are. Mm -hmm. So you need to show that you understand what the curriculum is. You don't need to know it off by heart, but you need to show that you are working towards the skills in the curriculum, so the different subjects. Mm -hmm. um, but that's basically it. You can provide evidence in any way, shape or form that you like. There's no set way to homeschool. So some parents follow a Montessori method or a Steiner method. Some people are, you know, eclectic homeschoolers. Some people are unschoolers. There's a whole vast spectrum of ways to homeschool. <coughs> but as long as you can show that your children are learning and they're growing and they're doing something, that's all you need to do. Mm -hmm. So do you have reports that you have to provide? No. So the way I personally work, and everyone does it differently, if we do anything on paper, it goes literally in that drawer over there. There's two piles, they just go in there. And then we have a little app on our phone, it's called Evidence for Learning, and we just take photos. So if it's something that's not on paper, I take a photo, I write a sentence, I can link it to the curriculum if I want. And then at the end of the year, when our moderator comes, he gets a pile of paper, he gets the report from the Evidence for Learning, and that's it. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, yeah. making all of this situation now relevant um, to, to families in the current situation with COVID-19, um, parents are not expected to be teachers, rather to assist their children's teacher by observing their children um, in their education. So as a parent with eight years education experience and four years homeschooling, personally, what do you think are the major challenges facing parents in the situation at the moment? Sorry, Rach, you froze up a little bit there, but I think what you were asking was, um, what do I think about the situation right now for parents that are homeschooling? Yes, yeah. So what yeah. are the, ch the major challenges? The challenges. Um, so I think it's important to have a distinction between what parents are facing right now who've come out of school and are doing that, that schoolwork at home and homeschoolers. So what most of those people are doing now is distance education as opposed to homeschooling. So... Us homeschoolers are also facing a lot of changes at the moment. We don't have any of our normal networks. We normally have big homeschooling groups and little homeschooling groups and excursions and stuff going on. 
So it's really different for us as well. We also find it really challenging. Mm -hmm. For people that have come out of school and a distance learning, they're having to work within the confines of the school system at home. So that can be challenging. I have heard reports of um, schools expecting six hours a day of work, which is not what homeschooling, when you're schooling kids at home, that is too much. But I think it's very challenging to be able to provide that role when it's not your choice to do it, when it's potentially not your kid's choice to do it. Because I know there's a lot of kids that are like, I want to go back to school. I hate you being my teacher. <laughs> and I want to go back to my real teacher. And I think just trying to juggle what is already a full life with this extra responsibility as mm -hmm. well. Um, I think the schools are doing a great job from what I hear of providing learning materials. But I think homeschooling is a lifestyle choice. And a lot of parents are now being thrown into that lifestyle without any say in the matter. Okay. So you're saying the major challenge at the moment is, is that the parents and the children are in a situation that they haven't categorically chosen to be in um they really? have to be in for the moment uh, and the difference really with what you do um homeschooling is the fact that you've actually made that choice now yeah uh, um and and the fact that also parents probably feel in some way shape or form that they're unqualified although that they're not required to be a teacher they're yeah. just required to observe yeah. so that so yeah, sorry go go Oh, no, I was, I was just agreeing previously. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they yeah. are the major challenges, I guess, um, that you sort of see parents having at the moment. But what about some of the most typical and common challenges that the children themselves are facing when being homeschooled? What do you seem, see? Yeah. Those being? I, um, so I think in this current climate, it's, it's socialisation. It's not normally for us as homeschoolers. We actually end up getting way too much socialisation <laughs> rather than not enough. But I think for everybody at the moment, we, we don't have any contact. We don't have physical contact with people. And it's all well and good being on a computer screen, but we're human beings. We need that physical contact with other people. So that's really, really challenging. I've also heard from a few parents that um, they are feeling like they're having to motivate their kids. And I think this is a real school, um, I guess, school-induced Thing. So a lot of the time in schools, um, their kids' motivation to learn is very different than it is for us as homeschoolers. Mm -hmm. So I think they're kind of, they're con you know, trained to kind of go through this system and this process. And now they've had the whole system taken away and they're just at home, they're still expected to get the same results. Mm -hmm. So I think that can be really frustrating for kids and for parents as well. There's this mm -hmm. kind of change in role as well. So they're kind of like, hold on, but you were my mom. You were never my teacher. I don't want to do this. This is not the classroom. I don't have to do this work. Yeah, definitely um, a big thing. I would say technology for all of its benefits keeps people connected um, whilst we are in social isolation at the moment. Um, I mean, do you have any tips how parents can um, help their children sort of overcome that feeling of being sort of so isolated um, and disconnected at the moment through the likes of technology? I mean, it's really hard at the moment. Um, you know, we still feel isolated. So, I mean, there, obviously there's, you know, there's a lot of online stuff available. Um, one of the things that I think is useful is not necessarily, you know, a one-on-one -on -one talk like this, but, um, and I've suggested them to businesses as well, is co-working sessions. So when you're not working on the computer or if you've got two screens, to be able to just do your work with someone else alongside you. So they're just there, they're not necessarily talking, but maybe every now and again you go, hey Joe, what did you get on question four? So it's similar to a classroom where it's not a face-to-face, -face, you know, interaction, but everyone's just kind of there together. I think we just have to use the technology we've got to try and stay connected as much mm -hmm. as possible. We're doing um, a few things, uh, my kids love Skyping with their homeschool friends for starters, but that normally involves them trying to shoot each other from the screen and do crazy things. Um, but we've got a friend who's now new to homeschooling. We're going to do um, a reading program together <laughs> on Zoom. So we'll do a little bit of it online together. We'll maybe share our answers and we'll go away and work on it and we'll come back. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just a period of time that we just have to try and make it 
through really and do the best that we can and not spend too much time on screens even though they're our only connection at the moment yeah um, so we published your article titled five tips to make homeschooling easier for a parent who hasn't read the article can you give us a little bit of an overview what it's about and just tell us what inspired you to write it um, it's kind of just the accumulation of things that I've found really useful over the last four years. So um, I remember the first year homeschooling, I just thought, oh my gosh, what have I gotten into? <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy. How am I possibly going to make this work? And running a business alongside it was really hard because I didn't have the time to kind of problem solve things. So I've just tried to sum up the stuff that I think is valuable and that can be super helpful in limited time. Mm -hmm. Now, what would you, what would be your best advice for someone in their in their first few weeks of homeschooling? Um, okay, so it kind of depends, firstly, on whether we're talking about kids that have never gone to school or kids that are already in the school system. Mm -hmm. So we have um, a, a term in homeschool that's called de-schooling. And it basically is the kind of decompression from being in school. Um, and I, I can't remember the exact figures, but there, there's basically a, a number of weeks for each year that you've been in school. And that time is really non-learning time. It's a, a rejig back to neutral because there's a massive change between being in a school and homeschooling. So you need to relearn how education and learning works. So there's a gap. So if your kids have been in school and they've been in school for a while, don't put any expectations on yourself. Just don't do anything. Just let them live life. Let them go out and garden. Let them cook. Let them build things. Let them just decompress for a while. Deschooling also applies to us as adults. So we have to relearn that a lot of the stuff that we maybe expect in school doesn't have to apply to education. So for a lot of parents, they think that they have to recreate this whole school you know, environment. So they think, oh, well, I have to have a school room and I have to have a desk and I have to have the colour coded folders. And then we have to do, you know, English at this time every day and we have to work for six hours a day. And it's simply not true for most of us. So we have to kind of rejig our expectations of what education is because it's not school at home. Some people do teach homeschooling at school at home and is a valid homeschooling. Um, I guess, form of, of learning, but it's not the only one. So it's a big thing that, you know, what is there doesn't necessarily have to be at home. And then definitely it's quality over quantity. So because we have to, you know, explain to the moderators how we're meeting all the expectations that we have, a lot of parents can spend a lot of time focused on ticking all the boxes. Yes, I've done history. Yes, they've learned how to, you know, do these sight words or yes, they've learned how to do algebra. But really what's more important and the reason that we homeschool is to sit down and do quality learning with our kids. So if today all you manage to do with your pre-primary child is sit and read early reader books, but you do them really, really well and they really understand the core concepts in it, that is far more beneficial than covering four subjects in one day and they've just kind of skimmed over it and they don't know. Mm -hmm. So I think those things really just start small, quality, don't expect it to be like school. Okay. So what I'm hearing, tell me if this is correct, and this is a concept that we've spoken about a lot um, this week mm. um, as well in, in, in other interviews, um, which is great to see that the message is concurrent from um, people of all different education um, disciplines is the fact that, um, you know, that education isn't necessarily always just academic. It's about a parent having the perspective of saying, well, in every moment of every day that there are opportunities to be able to teach our children, um, no matter what, what it is, as you said before, it could be from gardening, it can be from cooking, cooking itself is a science experiment, it can be mathematical, it can be all of these different things. Mm. So don't think that um, education is just academic and it's just while the children are sitting down at their desk in um, and as you are observing them in their homeschooling. Is that, is that what you were trying to say earlier? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think one of the helpful things there is recording everything. And I think I learned this when I did family daycare because we were under the early years learning framework back then. Mm -hmm. So 
take photos of every single thing you do. Maybe you go out on a bush walk and then when you come back, you look at the photos and you go, oh, you know, we saw a cocoon from a, from a moth or something. Oh, cool. Okay, so we did some science. Oh, but also we talked about the different patterns in the trees and how some trees have more branches than others. Oh, suddenly we've got a bit of maths in there. And then we went to the mailbox and we pulled something out and we talked about the words on the front of it. Oh, suddenly we've got literacy in there. And then we looked at like the hills and the different terrain as we're walking. Suddenly we've got geography. Mm-hmm. And then maybe you talk about, you know, how this, what, the, what this area was used for, for the indigenous people of the area. Suddenly you've got history. Suddenly mm-hmm. you've covered almost all your subjects. You've done phys ed because you're walking. You've covered <laughs> all your subjects in one bush walk. So it's not that hard, but sometimes it's more about how you perceive what you've done rather than planning more things. Mm-hmm. So this is um, a lesson for parents in perspective and lateral thinking yes. is what I'm hearing yes. at the moment. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> I know it's not about the kids it's about us learning something new yeah Yeah, as well as well (laughs) yeah as homeschool parents get really really good at being uh yeah adaptable (laughs) in saying this on the fly (laughs) how do you deal with teaching children of different ages as well yeah it's that's a really tough one um so I only I'll put the disclaimer and I only have two kids and they are um two years apart almost three years apart But I did teach family daycare and I had children from like infants up to, I think my eldest was 11 and I had seven kids in one day at one time and some of those were homeschoolers. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really, really tricky. And I think parents need to be really easy on themselves when they've got little ones who don't have a nap. So when they have a nap, it's great. You can teach during the nap time. When they don't, it can be really, really challenging, especially if you've got kids that will only do things for, you know, 10 minutes at a time. It's probably one of the most challenging things for bigger families. Mm -hmm. I think that's where it does come into planning and preparation. Mm -hmm. So I always say I plan things that take me less time and them more time. So I've made the mistake over the years of making these kind of like elaborate activities that they can do and then they play with it for 10 minutes. I'm like, that took me three hours to create. <laughs> so you flip that. So flip something's going to take you. Try and find something else. Yeah, that yeah, takes you take 10, 10 minutes. minutes gonna, they're going to play with it for three hours. Yeah, definitely. So something to occupy the smaller ones, even if you don't feel like it's valuable. Mm-hmm. So I know a lot of parents are like, oh, but they're just doing Play-Doh or they're just playing on the device or whatever. Whatever they need to do so that you can allocate stuff to the other child. Now that my boys are slightly older, so my youngest is um, five and my oldest child is eight. Mm -hmm. So the five-year-old has a shorter attention span um, than the eight-year-old and neither of them can work independently at the moment. So they both have things that they need me to sit down with them. So what I tend to do is before the week starts, I plan a whole heap of activities, whether they're worksheets, whether they're hands-on things that they can do independently. They're potentially still learning something from it. Like the other week, the five-year-old did a um, a painting by a famous painter and he coloured it in. And so it was a bit of art. We talked a little bit about the artist, but he could do most of it on his own. So I plan these things. They sit together. One of them does something independently. I work with the other one and then we swap over. So now that they're older, that's the easiest way for me to do it. Um, The other thing is that we do similar activities, but at a different age range. So you can do the same science activity with a kid, you know, a range of children across ages. And I do this when we do our homeschool um, co-op that we do. So across a range of ages, maybe the older children do more of the recording and the analysing and the question answering and the, you know, the harder (coughs) stuff. The younger children, maybe they just pour the water in and then they kind of watch and they're playing around the outskirts. So I think if you can find activities where you've got this gradient, where it's like easier here, but you've got more that you can add to it, then it works really well for big age groups. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing is it's about asking the the older child the better questions or the the, the more open-ended questions. um, Yeah, or they got, you know, if we're talking about science, maybe they go off afterwards and they research further as to why those materials acted the way they did. Mm -hmm. What other materials have similar qualities that might act the same? 
you know, you say to them, how could you expand on this activity? Do you just give them more to do attached to that? Mm -hmm. And I think um, a lot of the time that we forget um, how expansive their imaginations are and their view of the world is sometimes and I think it's us adults that have really sort of become quite rigid in our thinking and our view and outlook yeah. on life a little bit so we actually sometimes just need to tap into to just their you know the the, the lens that they see the world um a Absolutely. little bit yeah. I think one of my favorite questions when I was running family daycare was we'd go somewhere and the kids would say oh look you know that that tree's green look at the green leaves and we used to say huh I wonder why the trees, your leaves are green. And when you say, I wonder why to a child, they suddenly Open go... Open-ended. Well, maybe it's because of this and because of that. And you're kind of admitting, well, maybe I don't know, but I'm interested in why it might happen. So, yeah, a lot of those open-ended questions are really helpful for kids. Yeah, even for us adults too, they always say, if you want a better answer... <laughs> ask a better question or ask it in a certain way so everything can be absolutely yeah and yeah just... i was talking with um some of my my clients in my group the other day and we were doing a healing session online and they were talking about partners and having trouble with partners and i said one of my favorite questions for my partner was always if you did know the answer what would it be and he'd <laughs> always come up with the answer when i'd ask him that but he never knew beforehand so often we know the answer we just don't think about it yeah, it's just how we ask the question. Now, ne next question, saying that for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> what are your best strategies, um, like for from still working from home and or running a business and and also trying to um, create the space to take a break from um, homeschooling at the moment? Because, I mean, life yeah. is busy. Everybody at the moment has got, you know, multiple dis disciplines that they're trying to sort of, um, you know, sort of squeeze into a day. So, so what's your point and your, um, your, your view on this? Yeah, it, it's probably one of the hardest things. And I think at the moment, one of the big things is everyone's having to learn new ways of doing things. And our brains are just like full. They're full <laughs> of stuff. Um, I started when, um, so we live in the country. When we first moved here, I was already homeschooling and my partner was working still in the city. So he was traveling from six, oh, no, five in the morning and he wouldn't get home until dinner time at night. So I was trying to run a business where I was doing the 15 billable hours of clients, which is kind of like 25 hours more of actual work um, with these kids. And I had a one and a half year old and I think Harry was four. So it, it's very much a challenge. And I think often we try and pack a lot in and try and do it all. If we can simplify anything, just do it. And I say these are little things like, say you change your sheets once a week, maybe for right now, that's once a fortnight. Like, what can you spread out? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's, you know, taking the time to set up your, show, your grocery list on Woolworths, not that you can at the moment, but in normal life, so that all you have to do for your weekly shop is add all those things to the cart and pick it up rather than doing them individually. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it takes a little bit of time to set these things up, but what can you set up in your kind of life stuff that will make life easier for you? Um, really lowering expectations. I had very low expectations <laughs> and it really worked well. The house is messy, cool. Okay, that's fine. Everyone's house is messy. We just don't show it. So definitely that stuff. Um, I think people think that they have to do things at a certain time. So I had a friend say to me, oh, but my kids have to do their schoolwork in the morning because that's when they learn best. And I said, okay, is that something that you've actually discovered from your children? Or she said, well, no, that's just what the school does. They do all their literacy in the morning. I said, okay, well, that's the school. Why don't you try doing it a different way? So her thing was that she wanted to do her work in the morning because that was the best time for her. So she's now switched that. The kids do their schooling in the afternoon. So it's okay to do things at a time that you want to. Maybe your kids do their schooling on a Saturday morning. Maybe they do it on a Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Like this, it's just time. It's just relative. You can do it whenever you want. Um, there's a couple of things that, so there's a few strategies that you can use for kids around time management. One of them with little kids is a traffic light system. So if you're working in an office at home, you can have a traffic light for the kids. If it's on red, do not interrupt me unless you're literally bleeding, because I am busy, I don't have time. 
If it's on amber, you can interrupt me if it's important. And then green is just go ahead. If you need your Lego pulled apart, go for it. So that can be useful for little kids. For older kids, um, one of the strategies is things like, we used to call it have a minute time. So it's a certain allocated time each hour that you can come and interrupt me. So say I'm working from nine to 11, well from 9.45 to 10, you can come and ask me whatever questions you want to ask me. That's your time to interrupt rather than coming in over and over. So it's just about finding some of those strategies that will work for your family. Um, and I think the other thing is enlisting help. So at the moment, this is hard. Um, it's not impossible, but it's hard. We have, I talked about this before, we have a, we call it the homeschool exchange. Um, that's what one of our dads named it. We have a group of three families and each family has two kids. So twice a week, they go to one of those families. They don't just go and play, that family teaches a lesson to the kids. So not only do we go, cool, science is done. There's a photo of it. I haven't had to do it, but you get, you know, three or four hours on your own to do whatever you want. And we just rotate it through the families. Mm -hmm. It's really useful when we can actually see people, but we can still do similar things online. So, you know, getting grandparents to get on a Zoom call or a FaceTime call and, you know, read kids a book if they're little ones, if they're older ones to help them. Um, I had a friend who was saying that her older child was helping her younger child with science work which works really well until suddenly they're in different districts and they can't actually connect. And so I said, well, why don't you just get them to Zoom? So now they just Zoom together and the older child helps the younger child over Zoom. Mum can go off and do whatever she needs to do and she has that time. So it's a kind of about enlisting all that help as well. Mm. I think the other thing is, do you know what? If there's a day or if there's a week when you don't do anything, that's okay. We often take breaks not during school holidays time. We'll work during school holidays and we'll take our break in the middle of the term. So just take the break when you need to. It's mm -hmm. your time. You can do whatever you want. You don't have to have a specific term like a school does. So what I've heard, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, is that, that um, is it, so it's a matter of systemizing and streamlining your time. And so what time that you have working out where the fat is and trimming the fat um, and yeah. things don't have to be perfect at the moment. The house doesn't have to be perfect. That's fine. You can systemize, you can exactly. streamline that. The other part of that, that conversation I heard is that you need to be able to have some structure around your day um, where you for example, if you are needing to work from home or you are running your business from home as well, providing the kids a structure as to these are the times when mummy and daddy is working. So, you know, yeah. you, you have this structure, you can ask us these questions during this time, etc. cetera, is, is what I'm hearing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Absolutely. Cool. And I'm really honest with my kids too. Like I've said to them in the past, if they kept coming and interrupting me, I've said, do you know what I'm doing? And they'll go, you're working. I'll go, great. So when I work, I earn money. You know the Lego that you like? It costs money. So if you want to buy these things, if you want to go these places that cost money, I need to work. And suddenly they go, right, got you. <laughs> and they go off and they don't come back and interrupt me because they want to, you know, they want to have an income. We all do. And that's why we work, right? Mm -hmm. So that we can have these things. So why not teach our kids, this is what I'm doing and this is why I'm doing it. And suddenly it becomes more relatable to them. Mm -hmm. Um. The last question I wanted to ask you is that, you know, um, and I've been reading up the advocacy groups um, say that homeschooling is the best, best solution for children with special needs and children with disabilities um, who are finding traditional school um, doesn't really meet their, their needs. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I think it can be true and it cannot be true. I think each individual child has an environment that serves them best just like we do as adults there are workplaces that wouldn't serve me it serves me to work from home I specifically do what I do because I enjoy it and it's the lifestyle works for me and it's the same for kids there are a lot of kids that do work best in a classroom that the structure works for them that the, the larger group of children work for them that having the same children every single day works for them. And then on the other hand, there are kids that homeschooling works better for. I think when we're talking about um, kids that have 
high medical needs or disabilities or any you know extra challenges which i think we all have we all have extra challenges in some way shape or form yes it absolutely can work really well for those kids to be at home they have a much more individualized learning it can be catered to them especially kids with sensory needs that environment can be controlled for them and then gradually introduced at the same time that can be a big pressure on parents so if you've got a kid that's very high needs and you are having people say the best place for them to learn is at home that's a lot of responsibility to have when you're already dealing with a high needs child mm -hmm. so we fostered for quite a long time or well, for a couple of years that was really hard work if someone had said to me it would be best for her if she was homeschooled I don't know what I would have done. I couldn't have coped with that. That was too much pressure. I needed her to go to school. I needed someone else to share the load with me. So I think it's a really individual thing. I think people need to look at their own family dynamics, their kids, themselves, their lifestyle, where they live, what support they've got around them and decide whether this works better for them or not. And I think it's not a black or white answer. It's okay to go to school. It's okay to homeschool. It's okay to unschool. It's okay to distance education. It's okay to do any of these things as long as it serves you well. Yeah. Look, Sharon, you've um, shared some really insightful um, information with us today, and I'm really, really grateful. If you were just to recap your top tips for parents at this time, what would they be? Um, I think the biggest thing is just don't be hard on yourself. Just do what you're doing look for, you know, at the end of the day, go rather than going, oh, I didn't do this and I didn't do that and I didn't get the house done, I didn't do this. Look at what you have done. Have you got happy kids at the end of the day? Have they learnt something? Whether that's, you know, that when you clog up the drain, water goes all over the floor <laughs> or whether that's actually like they've developed a skill in reading. Cool. Are you happy? And are you having that time for yourself to fulfill your needs? And I think if you can tick those boxes, then you're done. Move yes. on to the next day. Thank you so much for your time today, Sharon. If parents have got any questions for you um, or, what, what, or like want to reach out to you after this chat, whereabouts can they find you? Um, you can find me on Facebook mainly is where I am. Um, so I have a page on Facebook, which I think is in the article. Um, I have a group there as well that's part of my work as a movement teacher. So I share lots of mindfulness stuff in there as well. Uh, happy to have people send me a PM through the page and ask any questions about homeschooling. Thanks, Sharon. Take care and we'll speak to you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye.